Welcome back for uh, some more video lectures for critical reasoning. This is part one, the part one video for the um, crash course in formal logic module, the first module after the first exam, which is what I wanted to open with was uh, congratulations on getting done with the first exam. It's, it's pretty tough. Um, there's a lot of difficult things that you're being asked to do in this first few modules of the course, and congratulations on getting through it. Um, if you uh, have any concerns about the first exam, remember there's going to be a makeup opportunity. Um, but I would highly recommend that you get in contact with me to maybe do some debriefing with the first exam. Uh, usually when I'm doing this on an in, on campus in a classroom sort of version of this class instead of online, uh, I host a little special session outside of class where students can come and we can review the problem, uh, the answers to the problems on the exam and talk through like, what would have been better, or how could I have improved this, or what should I be thinking about for next time on the makeup, stuff like that. So I'd love to give you that same opportunity. Um, you will, of course, see your grade, um, but there won't be as many comments, and I will do that intentionally. I'm not going to put comments on your exam answers, mostly because I want you to have the opportunity to try to diagnose it for yourself. So if you see, oh, you missed you know, two out of six partial credit, can you figure out where you missed those two points? Um, that is a wonderful way to get some more practice with this material is to see if you can self-diagnose. Uh, and that's not just some kind of like um, rationalization for me doing less work as your instructor and trying to make it look like something that builds character. Um, this is critical reasoning that we're training in this class. And one of the most difficult things about it being a critical reasoner is that there isn't a person who's going to be over your shoulder telling you whether you're reasoning properly you have to be able to learn how to identify your own mistakes or to like question your own reasoning um, rather than to just go with your gut or trust your intuition. Um, most, most of critical reasoning is not about criticizing other people. It's really about criticizing ourselves, holding our own thought accountable, being like, if I'm the one who's trying to figure out the answer to this and there isn't an authority about this, how am I supposed to become an authority? What do I need to be looking out for? How am I going to double check my own thinking to make sure that I got it right? So I, that's an important part of just the class in general, and that is something I want to make available to you working with the exam. And like I mentioned, um, I think in the first week, the first early videos, the, er, the intro videos to the class, I was saying how these exams, I want to be not just some kind of evaluative mechanism in the class, but a, another type of learning opportunity. So um, giving you the chance to try to sort out your own exam answers first is something I wanted to give you the space for. But there is nothing stopping you from contacting me past that point, especially if you uh, kind of want to talk it over a little bit more or make sure that you're on the right track about it, that you can talk to someone with some more experience um, dealing with these, developing these skills to get advice about how to improve your own. So um, I encourage you to wrestle with it on your own and then also to go and get some help from me. So do both. Um, those I think that's going to be the best game plan for... Um, helping you achieve mastery with this stuff. Once, um, I, you, you'll be able to have access to the makeup exam soon. I've got to program that. i got to get that up into Canvas. Um, but don't worry about the makeup quite yet. Just let's focus on logic. That's what we're going to start doing here. But stay tuned for that. That'll start happening. And I would say after you've talked to me, then maybe go and do the makeup. But don't just like get your exam score back and then immediately go and do the makeup. I highly discourage you from doing that. I want you to spend some time with the original exam and try to diagnose how things went um, before you give it another shot. Um, and uh, one last little reminder about the makeup. Um, the makeup will be uh, modular, so you don't have to redo the entire exam. You can just redo the sections that you want to um, and try to, to get some more points on those sections. So enough about the exam. Let's start talking about logic. So. We're moving into the second big chunk of this course. And the whole first part I was describing is like just really about listening. We're just trying to listen to understand what people are saying when they're arguing, when they're using language as a part of this activity of arguing, a speech act, right, um, of arguing. Now we're going to get into evaluation. So how do we tell whether the argument is a good argument or a bad argument? Well, we've kind of already um, uh, talked about some of these things. Um, in previous video lectures, especially the stuff in module, uh, the last module, the stuff on chapter five, because there's really only two standards of a good argument. Having all true premises, having a good support relation. And if you remember our discussion about those standards before, I was saying 
there's two different ways that we try to evaluate whether something has a good support relation. We could use this standard of validity or we could use this inductive standard of strength. So deductive validity or inductive strength. These are two different um, measuring sticks that we could use to try to figure out is this a good support relation or not. Remember uh, validity, we're going to be digging into a lot more with validity. That's the whole point of formal logic is to understand validity in a much more precise um, and necessary and final sort of way, exhaustive sort of way. So we're going to be focusing a lot on that. But remember our informal notion of validity from before was an idea of the the truth of the premises providing a total guarantee for the for the truth of the conclusion. So the argument is valid if and only if if the premises are true, the conclusion must be true. It would be impossible to have all true premises and a false conclusion at the same time. That's what it takes for an argument to be valid. That's what we're going to be digging into a lot more. We're going to be building off of that understanding that we talked about with validity as we extend it with formal logic. Uh, and then the next module after this is going to be devoted to inductive reasoning and the standard of strength. So we'll, we'll talk about strength later. Um, we're just going to focus more on validity right now with this formal logic section. The other standard of a good argument, so th this whole middle unit, this third, or the, I'm sorry, the second third of the course is really just devoted to how to evaluate the support relations of arguments. Does the conclusion follow from the premises or not? Um, to, to address the, the issue about having all true premises would require way more time, and that's this entire philosophical field of epistemology. How do we have knowledge at all, period? How do we get the bits of knowledge that then we reason with to try to have other knowledge? So what is, you know, before we can talk about knowledge gained through reasoning, we're like, where does knowledge start from? That's an epist epistemological question. Um, how can I know that my premises are in fact true? There's a lot that's going on there. Um, very often, our knowledge is based on some other sort of argument. So I know those premises are true because I got some more evidence to back up why I should think those premises are true. That's a separate like sub-argument, another support relation. You remember the diagrams here? We have like an arrow to the conclusion, and then you have a premise here. Well, that premise could be the conclusion of another argument with more premises. And we can evaluate that support relation, but again, that would also depend on those premises being true. Epistemology is the area of philosophy that's devoted to, to those kinds of considerations. How do we know whether those premises are in fact true? And there's an incredible amount of difficulty <laughs> and complexity that's involved with where knowledge comes from. And we're not going to get into any of that in this class. This is just about reasoning processes. So how we reason from certain premises to certain conclusions. It doesn't matter if the premises are true if they don't provide adequate evidence for the truth of the conclusion. It won't, it won't matter. Like, um, uh, I'm wearing a Cubs hat, so the Cubs are going to win tonight. I, that's just a terrible argument. It is definitely true that I'm wearing a Cubs hat, but the conclusion does not follow from the truth of the premises. So it doesn't matter if I'm able to sort out that, yeah, well, at least I know that I'm wearing a Cubs hat useless to me in this argument because the premise does not provide any support for the conclusion. So that's what we're going to be focusing on uh, here with logic and um, with formal logic and inductive strength. So that's kind of what you have to look forward to here for the next two um, modules of the course. Oh, I'm going to sneeze. I'm going to pause. Oh, I'm happy I got to the pause button in time. That was a very, very big sneeze. That would have been really annoying to listen to if you had headphones on. Oh man, I think there might be more. Sorry. Okay. Deductive validity and formal logic. What are we going to be doing here? The book tries to ease you into this by talking about what goes on with translating from English, the way we like make claims in English, and the logical aspects that are in there. They're, they're already in there in the natural language or however else we're thinking. But how to translate from English into this specialized symbol language, it looks a lot like math, to capture that has these symbols to capture these formal logical relationships in, in the claims that we make and the arguments that we make. And the book, so the book tries to start with English, get you to see the argument, and move you into, um, into the logic language from there, and then show you how the logic language works. And it's okay. I, I, the book's presentation is, is decent. I am going to present it a slightly different way for you 
in these video lectures. Now, now this first video lecture, my main plan is just to kind of walk you through the whole thing that we're going to be doing. All of the skills that I'm going to be asking you to learn in this in this module, this crash course in formal logic, that you could take formal logic classes. The cows come home. There, we at BCE we offer uh, an entire course on symbolic logic. So this is just a little taste of what uh, philosophy 120 looks like. So if you like it, you might take 120. Um, and if you go, uh, BC doesn't have more advanced logical classes, but if you go to another like university or something, their philosophy department will usually offer some other uh, more advanced logic classes. And there's a lot of cool things to do with formal logic. It's a whole field unto itself. Um, it, it is it is a lot like math. Um, there there's a symbolic language and there are rules and everything is clear cut. So if you've been sick of the fuzzy stuff for a while with this class, this might be a little breath of fresh air because a lot of what we're going to be doing with this unit is um, has has a very clear and discreet right answer. <laughs> so if you got it right, it's going to be very obvious. You might like that. And most of this is just about turning a crank, using a procedure, following the rules. Um, I really like board games. Um, in fact, actually, eh, you might have been wondering about this. There's a whole bunch of my board games. I have lots of board games. Board games are a lot like logic. You have to play according to certain rules, and you have a goal that you're trying to get to. You're trying to understand the structure of how the game works. You're trying to understand the structure of how claims work and how reasoning works. And that's what logic is all about. So I'm going to be using a game metaphor quite a bit. But I do want to, in this first video, I want to walk you through all the procedures of what we're going to be doing and these formal skills that we'll be learning in this module. So you get kind of the big picture view. And if I'm going really fast and it's not making sense, don't worry, you don't have to go back and rewatch the video over and over and over again trying to follow it. What I'm going to be doing in the following videos is I'm going to be spelling out in much more detail each one of those steps. But in this first video, I want to give you the big picture. When I get to the details, I'm going to switch up the order from how the book teaches logic. So, like I was saying, the book teaches you the English translation into formal logic first and then shows you how the formal logical language works. I'm going to go backwards. We're going to start talking about how the logical language works and then figure out how to get English to work with it. Um, because this is this is kind of a main theme for this module uh, and for trying to approach mastery of this material. English is really fuzzy. Very, very fuzzy, as you well know at this point in the course. Hopefully, I mean, if you didn't know already, this course has probably been like, yeah, English is pretty messy. Conversational implication, um, having to make judgment calls about what people mean, blah, 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 blah. Really, really messy, very ambiguous, vague, whatever. That's English. Big mess. Logic, totally clean. No ambiguity. No exceptions to rules. Everything's straightforward. We know exactly what we're talking about every moment with logic. Trying to translate from a fuzzy language into a very clean language is a challenging thing to do. Um, and there's going to be some complexities there with getting these translations. Ideally, we, we're going to want to take English arguments, put them into the logical symbol language, and then use the symbol language to be able to understand how that argument is structured and ultimately whether the argument is valid or not in a way that doesn't rely on the fallibility of our own imagination. Remember having to think up counterexamples to test whether an argument was valid or not? We're going to have a much more rigorous procedure now using this formal logical language. Um, so the logic language is, is actually the one that's kind of nicer to work with than the, than the English. Um, but we are going to have to, in order to use the, the kind of formal logic technique in a real life case, we're going to have to translate from a natural language like English. So that's also going to be a step of this procedure. So I've got a very simple little example um, that I have prepared uh, that we can take a look at here and, uh, and work with. Um, as we try, as I try to give you a, a little brief demonstration of everything that we're going to be doing. So let's pull that up. Um, okay, so here's a, here's an, a very very simple argument, um, and I actually even gave a little diagram here of like what kind of structure it would have. So this is if we got through the um, sort of listening phase and we structured the argument in standard form and then put it to a diagram, we would get this kind of product. From this, we're going to translate into a formal logical language, and then we're going to use something I haven't made here yet, um, but in this spot, we're going to make a truth table, what we're going to call a truth table. In fact, I'll just I'll make a little thing here. 
truth table. That's going to happen in a little while. Truth table. That'll happen in this spot. Um, that will allow us to use the logical translation to figure out if the argument is valid or invalid in a way that has absolute certainty to it. Um, so where am I getting this example from? Well, I was just talking about board games, and maybe that's why I was thinking about board games, is because I got a board game here as an example. This is from the board game Clue. Here, let me show you a picture. So here, here's a picture of the Clue board game. Um, there are cards. That, so in, the, in this game, I, some people, a, a lot of people have played this game. That's why I choose it as an example. But maybe you have not played Clue before. So let me give you a brief explanation of what's going on here. So there's a deck of cards. Uh, there's a murder that's happened, and there's all these suspects. It's mansion, murder, mystery, mansion, sort of the classic setup here. Um, and there are cards for all of the suspects. You can see here's one of the figures. I don't know who that is there. But one of the suspects, um, the, uh, the different weapons that they could have used to murder the person, and which room. So there's all these rooms in the mansion where the murder could have taken place. At the beginning of the game, one card of each cat of each category is put into this secret envelope without anyone looking at it, and then all the rest of the cards are shuffled up and dealt out to the people playing the game. So at the beginning of the game, you, you're taking some notes here. You know you have a hand of cards. You know which cards could not be in the envelope because you've got them. And if, and as the course uh, of the game progresses you're able to see cards from other people's hands and start to use process of elimination to figure out what cards are uh, that were left in this envelope and then you try to make a guess to win. So that's how you play um, Clue in 30 seconds, <laughs> 30 second description. So let's say I've been playing the game for a little while and I've narrowed down the suspects of, of who could be the murderer to two. And that's what this first premise of the argument is saying. Either Colonel Mustard or Miss Scarlet is the murderer. I know that much at this point. And then I take my next turn, and I pull a card from your hand, and I look at it secretly, and hey, it's Colonel Mustard. So that must mean Colonel Mustard is not in that secret envelope because I saw the card in your hand. So that means Colonel Mustard is not the murderer. At this point, I can draw a conclusion. Maybe that, or not maybe probably definitely, Miss Scarlet is the murderer. It's got to be one of the two of them. It's not Colonel Mustard, so it must be Miss Scarlet. So let's say let's say I make this argument. The first thing I want to point out about this is it's kind of like a general point about formal logic. Um, I'm going to use it kind of, this is a metaphor that Immanuel Kant gave for logic, but logic is kind of like what you have left from thought when you drain away all of the content uh, of what we're talking about that came from sensation. So from anything that's a matter of contingent perception and experience. If you took all of that away, all of that sort of content that experience has, you'd be left with just the formal structure, and that's logic. Logic is what happens when we take all the content out. So if we look back at this argument, this one right here, like let's say instead of it being Colonel Mustard, you know, this this argument talks about Colonel Mustard. What about instead of us talking about that particular content, you know, Colonel Mustard showing up, let's say we were talking about um, Miss Peacock or Mr. Green or something. If I substituted some other person in for Colonel Mustard, this argument would still be just as good as the original one, right? I mean, you can you can kind of use your imagination here to check that this is valid. This is process of elimination. One or the other. It's not this one, so it must be the other one. And that, that argument is valid. As long as these premises are true, this conclusion must be true. I mean, that's just using our imagination, though. Again, we might want to know this with some greater certainty. But notice how the argument being valid does not change if we mess up, if we change that we're talking about someone else instead of Colonel Mustard. You know, if you take out Colonel Mustard, plop something else in, we're good. The same thing would be true if we pulled out is the murderer. Like what if we changed is the murderer every time it shows up to something else like I don't know like um, mm, is a banana lover. So instead of like being the murderer they they love bananas. Uh, I was gonna think up something better. That's the one I always use in the past but <laughs> I don't know why I think of banana lover. Um, but uh, that's that's what um, 
So yeah, if we if we switch up predicate here, it's not going to affect the validity either. So this is really interesting that we can. Um, there seems to be a form to reasoning that doesn't depend on what we're talking about. And knowing that and understanding the form of reasoning would be really cool to developing our like mastery of critical reasoning because it means we could have knowledge about evaluating arguments even if we know nothing about the subject matter. I think a lot of times we think in order to be able to make a judgment about something or to evaluate some reasoning that we need to be an expert in what the the reasoning is talking about, the subject matter that's at hand. And the thing about logic, I mean, that that's true with a lot of other things, like knowing whether the premises are true, for example. Probably need to be an expert, need to have some experience there. But to know whether the conclusion follows from the premises may not require that at all. All it may require is just a formal understanding from logic. That And, and remember, if you're going to have a good argument, you need to have all true premises and a good support relation. So if you can tell that the support relation is bad without having to know anything about the subject matter, it doesn't matter that you don't know whether the premises are true or not. You already know that the argument is bad. <laughs> Boom. So that's pretty cool about logic, that or that developing a skill set with logic and understanding logical forms and what are good patterns of reasoning and what are bad patterns of reasoning um, is really good because it lets you be able to evaluate things that you may not be in a position to otherwise have your own experience or judgment with. So that's pretty cool. That's one of the fun things about logic. Um, so that's what we're going to try to do here now, is we want to, we, we might look at this intuitively and recognize that it has this kind of conditional structure to it, uh, or this process of elimination structure to it. So now, how do we want to capture that? Well, we've got some symbols to help us out. We're, the first thing that we always do in, lo whoa, whoa, whoa. Sorry about that. The first thing we always do in logic is create something that's called a, actually I'm going to get rid of this so it's got some more space, um, something called um, a universe of discourse. So let's go in here, I'm going to make this a little smaller. Universe of discourse. The, the point here is to drain away all the content of what we're talking about in these claims so we can just see the form of the reasoning. So the way we're going to do this, the first part of our logical symbol language is going to be, oops, um, here I'll fix it. So the first part of our, our logical symbol, some, our logical symbolic language, where we're going to translate this English argument into, is to um, identify what are the discrete propositions that are uh, being talked about in this argument. So actually, let's take a little pause here. Let's talk about propositions. You're going to hear me give this word, say this word a lot in these lectures. Um, a proposition is just really a claim. And the, actually, the kind of symbolic logical system I'm going to be teaching you is something called propositional logic. And we have other ones too, modal logic, predicate logic. Um, there's, there's a bunch of other um, logical symbol languages out there. But most of them are really just throwing some kind of sophistication on top of propositional logic. So propositional logic is kind of like the square one of formal logic. And then we kind of build some other cool things in there. If you're if you're a programmer, um, you know how there's like different programming languages, but a lot of them play by the same ultimate rules. They might just carve things up in slightly different ways. There's some maybe some different symbols are used to represent the same function, etc. Same thing happens in logic. Okay, but we're going to start with the basics with propositional logic. What does that mean? Well, it's called propositional logic because it's dealing primarily in terms of propositions. A proposition is just a claim. So uh, anytime I say, um, uh, any, I've got a subject-predicate combo. I make a statement with a subject and a predicate. I'm making a claim, and that's a proposition. Um, that, there's, a little, there's a little bit of um, uh, philosophical um, hair-splitting that goes on with talking about statements versus propositions and claims and stuff like that. But for our purposes right now, without getting into some hairier philosophical waters, it's okay for us to think about these things as more or less equivalent. Um, a proposition is making a claim about, or making a statement is making a claim that captures a proposition. It says that a certain state of affair obtains in the world. So we can imagine a state of affair that isn't actually the case. Like if I was a uh, wearing a, God forbid, uh, St. Louis Cardinals hat on, sorry any Cardinals fans out there, um, you know, that's a state of affair that's not true. 
and someone could claim, oh, Tim, oh, yeah, I think he's a big St. Louis Cardinals fan. And I'll be like, nope, not true. But it is describing a state of affairs. It's, it's like this possible state of affairs. Tim Linneman it, it is the subject with the predicate is a St. Louis Cardinals fan. Ugh, I hate to hear that say. But that's a false proposition, okay? That's a, that's a claim that would be false because the actual state of affairs, what's actually happening with me, does not match with what the claim was saying is what's happening. Okay, maybe this sounds like maybe just obvious, like we're talking about what it means for something to be true. But this is important um, because when we make claims, um, sometimes we make simple propositional claims, sometimes we make complex propositional claims. You, you might, um, no, ah, this is a little old reference too, but Schoolhouse Rock, um, conjunction, junction, what's your function? You know how we can make complex sentences out of simple sentences. You can say, you can make one sentence, you can make another sentence, you can put them together with and, and now you've got a complex sentence. That's kind of like what happens with logic. I might have a simple proposition and another simple proposition, just like a subject and a predicate, and then I can combine them to make complex propositions with different types of things that we call logical operators. And I'll talk more about those in later videos. But actually, and is one of them. So I can make one claim, I can make another claim, I can say and in the middle, and boom, now I've made a more complex claim. I've made what we would call a conjunction in logic. Um, and that claim, whether that claim is gonna be true or false, depends on what's going on with its parts. And this is gonna be a key part of how formal logic is going to operate, that we'll be able to figure out the truth of more complex claims based on the truth of its component parts. So that's part of what we're going to be doing here. Um, there are some complex statements in the argument example that we've got here, um, but we need to first figure out, uh, oops, uh, first what are those simple propositions? What are the basic parts that then build, we make these more complex logical structures out of? So what is the basic like subject predicate? What are the basic states of affairs that are being talked about in the argument, whether the person is saying that they're true or false or whatever they're saying about them, what are the simple states of affairs, the propositions that the argument is talking about? That's the first thing that we have to do. Um, and here we go. For the most part, the homework problems always will give you a universe of discourse, but you, sometimes you have to make them up for yourself here. So let's let's go here. So what's one thing that this argument is talking about? What's a state of affairs that's under consideration here? Well, one of them is that um, Colonel Mustard maybe is the murderer, like Colonel Mustard being the murderer or not. Subject, Colonel Mustard, predicate, being the murderer. So let's have, um, oh, for clarity's sake, let's call it C. C is going to stand for, we're going to take a, a simple letter and have it stand for a simple proposition. So we'll have C stand for Colonel Mustard is the murderer. Oops. All right. So that's one of our simple propositions. But that's not the only thing this argument's talking about. Uh, it's also talking about Miss Scarlet being the murderer. So let's call that S. Scarlet is the murderer. Okay. Okay, so w when we put these like this, this is kind of like our equivalent of draining out the content from, and we just want to see what we're left with here. So here we got these simple propositions, and now we need to just figure out what sort of logical structure they're put in. Um, to make the claims that are actually here in the in the English argument. So, for instance, one of them is going to be a really really simple translation. This is the, you know, so-called translation step I was talking about earlier. Um, but here we can translate "Miss Scarlet is the murderer" that claim into an equivalent claim down here by just putting "s". If "s" stands for "Miss Scarlet is the murderer" and that's what claim number one is saying then boom, claim number one, we captured in logic, just putting S here. Easy, right? Doesn't take much work at all. Um, sometimes things are slightly more complicated, like, for instance, claim number two. This one says that Colonel Mustard is not the murderer, but we have Colonel Mustard is the murderer. Now, we could have put a not in here when we made the universe of discourse if we wanted to, but generally we don't want to do that. We want to try to show as much of the logical structure of the argument as we can, and we do have a logical symbol for um, a, a negation. That's actually the technical term for it, negation. Um, and it is the symbol that we use is this tilde. So if you put a tilde in front of something, that means not whatever follows it. So if we put not C, that's like saying it's not the case that 
Colonel Mustard is the murderer. And saying it's not the case that Colonel Mustard is the murderer is the same thing as saying Colonel Mustard is not the murderer. Those are equivalent statements logically. So we've captured the meaning of claim number two. So now we just have one more claim. Claim number three. Um, this one is saying either Colonel Mustard or Miss Scarlet is the murderer. It isn't saying that one of, or the other of these two different claims is true. So how are we going to capture this? Well, when it's saying either or, what that really means is that at least one of these two things is true. And we have a logical symbol for that too. And that's the wedge. So it's saying either Colonel Mustard is the murderer or Miss Scarlet is the murderer. So by putting it down here, this little wedge symbol is or. This means or in formal logic. Um, it's saying this claim is true or this claim is true. At least one of them is true. That's what or stands for. Now you might be saying to yourself, Tim, doesn't or also mean like one or the other but not both of them? Like it's not just at least one of them is true but it's one or the other and not both? And the answer is yes, there is a sense of or. That's what we call the exclusive use of or. But we... Um, we, and, and maybe the exclusive use of or is actually going on in this case, because if you take into account, account the context of the rules of Clue, uh, you can never have two cards uh, hanging out there in that little pocket. So, um, so maybe it would be exclusive. I'm going to keep it in this version, which is called inclusive, for now, uh, for simplicity's sake. But in the next video, we'll probably talk about these ambiguities with or statements all too soon. So don't you worry. We will get to that complexity. But what we've done here, uh, this first, this is the first step of logical analysis. Let, actually, I'm going to write that. So step number one of, of, log of a formal let's call it formal analysis that is probably a better choice of words step one of our formal analysis is translation so getting things from English into our logical symbol language the next step will be um, and actually I'll put that down here um, step number two is to um, craft a truth table uh, uh, for the argument. And to craft a truth table for the argument, what we're going to be really doing is crafting a truth table for each claim that's in the argument. Remember, again, with standard form here, we're saying this claim is true because these claims are true. So we want to see, basically, a truth table tells us under what conditions is this true and under what conditions is it false. And we want to look at the truth conditions for every single one of these claims to see whether it is possible, again going back to our definition of validity, is it possible to have all the premises be true and the conclusion false at the same time? If such a thing is not formally possible, because we look under every possible way in which it could work out and it doesn't happen, then we know the argument is valid. Before, when we were doing this informally, we were using our imagination, but our imagination can never exhaust all the possibilities we have to uh, maybe rely on some something a little more um, systematic and exhaustive, and that's what formal logic is. So the big key here is recognizing that the meaning of these statements is given by their truth conditions, by the and what and that's what a truth table is here to diagram is to tell us under what conditions is something true or false. I've actually made a little helpful guide here that I'm also going to post into the module as soon as I get done with this video. Um, to help you understand truth tables. Um, because the, the key idea here is that um, the truth conditions for this, oops, didn't mean to do that, for this complex statement is built out of the truth conditions of its component statements. So if I know what, what's going on with C and S, I can figure out what's going on with C or S. If I know what's going on with C, I can figure out what's happening with not C. Um, well, that's the, didn't intend that to be Nazi, um, but <laughs> maybe if I was smarter, I'd have a joke, a clever joke to say right now, but I am not, so I'm sorry for that wasted comedic opportunity. But um, knowing what is going on with a, with a single claim will let me know what's going on with the negation of that claim. Um, but here, let me pull up this little uh, helpful guide. Okay, here we go. So what you're seeing right here is a complete diagram 
of how all the different logical operators, again, those operators are what we call these things that glue together simple propositions into complex propositions. Um, there's only really five of them in propositional logic, conjunction, and, disjunction, or, conditional, if-then statements, the biconditional, if and only if statements, and the negation, not. Um, and we'll be going through these in more detail over the next few video lectures. Um, but here's, here's a truth table. It shows you a proposition, um, and then it shows you when that proposition is true or false under all the different possible truth conditions for its component parts. So think of um, the, the law of non-contradiction again. Law of contradiction is the thing that all of logic is based off of, and it says that every claim, every proposition, every statement is either true or false. It can't be both. It can't be neither. And you can think of, um, because there's only two possibilities for each claim, think of these as if they're like levers. They're like levers that could be in one of two positions, like on or off. If you've got two levers, and each lever can be in one position or another, like true versus false, like on versus off, how many different combinations of what states can you get that control panel to be in? You could have a situation where both of them are on, where both of them are off, where the first one is on and the second one is off, or the first one's off and the second one is on. Those are, there's no other possible combinations. Those are all of them. And that's what we've got going on here in the truth table too. So um, you've got where they're both true, where one of them's true, the other one's false, vice versa, and then both false. So we've covered all the combinations of what could be happening with the truth of these component parts. Again, we don't need to know what P stands for, and we don't need to know what Q stands for. Um, we just need to know that, the, that this statement here is composed of those two parts. It's like the general pattern of how AND statements work. And what this is saying is that there's only one case in which AND statements are true, in the case where the two component parts are true. If one of them is, if at least one of them is false, and I make the claim that both of these things are true, then I'm saying something false. That's how to understand this diagram. And I put little notes here. So you can think about what's happening over on this side as kind of like the inputs. These are just trying to figure out what are all the possibilities. Um, actually, let's, let's apply that bit of knowledge right now. If I'm going to make a truth table for this argument, first I just need to figure out what are all the different um, statements that we've got in the universe of discourse for the argument. And there's only two. We've got... Uh, We've got C and we've got S. That's it. So I'm going to make, oops, I didn't mean to do that. But let's do this. Like that. I like to put the double bar here to, and you'll see why in a second, why I like to do that. Um, but we've got two uh, propositions we need to be looking out for. C and S. And when I'm trying to figure out um, uh, what to, how to fill out the rest of this truth table, in this first part, I just need to capture all the logical possibilities. Um, I'm not calculating for anything right here other than just covering all my bases. So I know that there's going to be a true, a true, oops, this should be, hold on, it's transparent, oops. Hey, let me fix this. All right, there we go. So we got true, true, false, false. And I'm putting two of each because um, even though C can be either true or false, I'm trying to figure out all the combinations of truth for C and for S. So with um, two of them, there's going to be four possibilities. And there's actually a method here for how I make this truth table so I don't leave out any possibilities. Um, you can actually always think about it as uh, the formula here is 2 um, to the, uh, actually, so, uh, to the nth power, where n stands for the number of um, different letters, or let's call them propositional letters. There, I can keep this note here for make it smaller. Okay, so if we are doing with this version right here, I've got two 
to the second power because there are two there are two different letters here right so that's like two times two and that's four so I know that there are going to be four different um, possibilities think of each one of these rows here as one possibility one set of conditions so there's four possibilities both true one true the other false vice versa both false that's why I say here on this diagram that these are like the inputs we're just covering all of the all the different possible combinations of what could be happening and there's no possibilities I mean what's another possibility here what's another way what's another um, combination of truth values for C and S there isn't any other combination we have exhaustively covered them and that's pretty important for the power of logic let me make some rows here because we're going to, need to do this for the truth table so now that I've got all the possible values for C and S figured out, my next step is to figure out under which of these conditions are these statements true or false. So to do that, I'm going to make a different column for each of the different um, claims that's in the argument, all the premises and all the conclusion. Okay, I'm going to do all of those things. Um, actually, for a second, here, let's go back here to this truth table here. So this is how to read the truth table is this is setting up all the inputs, all the different possible combinations of truth value for these component parts for P and Q. This column here is saying is going to evaluate under these conditions here, when is this statement in its entirety true or false? So this is saying this statement is true under these conditions. This is saying this statement is false under these conditions. Okay, put these together. Beep, beep, beep. It's false. Okay, so these are these right here. These five top in the top row are the complex propositions that we're evaluating for. That we're trying to figure out what are their truth conditions. The claims we're diagramming for truth conditions. The way I worded it here. These are the truth values for the more complex propositions, given what's happening with their component simple propositions. And then this is really important here. So, I mean, these two notes are actually kind of connected. It's the full column here, the full column of truth values that tells you the meaning of this logical statement. Um, the meaning of a proposition or claim in logic is defined by its truth conditions. What does it take for it to be true and what does it take for it to be false? And saying something and something else is different than saying something or something else because um, of when it's true and when it's false. It's a different pattern here. Wonder what conditions is it true and false. So that's what we want to capture here with this particular argument as opposed to these really general operators. This, this is kind of the master check sheet, cheat sheet for logic. Um, but you always have to apply it into these more specific scenarios. So, so now I want to make a column for all the different claims that show up in the argument that we are dealing with right now. So we've got C or S, that's one of the premises. Um, and then we've got not C, again, <laughs> I wish I had a joke to make here. And then we have um, just good old S. And again, I like to make a um, double bar here to keep track of um, what are the premises and what are the conclusion. Um, because that'll be important for step number three, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Okay, so so far what I've done is I've set up the truth table. Now I need to actually calculate the truth values. So I need to know under which of these is this statement actually true and false. Now this is where this cheat sheet will come in handy. So we know with or, with or statements, oh there's a typo there, I'll have to fix that, I'll fix that. With or statements, they're true whenever at least one of the two parts is true it's only false down here when both of the component parts are false so I can basically copy that truth table over here when I'm dealing with this or statement as long as one of them is true it's gonna be true so here at least one of them is true it's true At least one of them is true so it's true here the C is false but uh, you know S is true so it's pulling the weight down here they're both false so I'm gonna put a false value here so now I'm actually doing some kind of calculation if you will of figuring out because uh, we can make much more complex statements than than what we've got right here well again we'll save that for the next lecture um, the way negation works is negation always flips the truth value of whatever it's negating so when P is true 
not p is false. When p is false, not p is true, which makes sense. If I'm denying something and that thing is actually false, then I'm saying something true. Okay. So that's what, how negation works. So here, not c, I just have to look at what's going on with c. As long as c is true, not c will be false. As long as c is true, not c will be false. When c is false, then not c is, woo, whoa, n, that's not anything, sorry, oops, and uh, another false will flip to true. Okay, and then with s, when is this statement true? Well, when it's true. So I can just really copy s true, s true, nothing else to see here. When s is false, then s is false, so on and so forth. And now our truth table is complete. Step two, done. So we, step one, translated the English into the formal logic, check. Then take that formal logic um, translation and make a truth table for the argument. We've done that, check. Final step, this is a really easy one. Step, whoa, whoa, whoa. Step number three, check the truth table to see if the argument is valid. That's, a, that's the last thing that we're going to do. And again, we're going to be looking for a counterexample. Um, so a counterexample for validity is all true premises yeah, let's do all true premises plus true or uh, false conclusion at the same time, and that's important. Right? It's got to be all at the same time. So we have all the possibilities here. These four rows showed us all the possible things that could be happening. So now we just need to see: is there a possibility in which all the premises are true and the conclusion false? So let's go through them one by one. Um, how about this first one? Well, this premise is true, but here this is a false premise, and we don't have a, f a false conclusion, so that's not happening. This is not a counterexample. Eep, didn't happen. How about this one? We've got a false conclusion and a true premise. Oh, but not all true premises. We've got to have all true premises to get the counterexample, so that's not a counterexample. Here, all the premises are true, but we don't have the false conclusion part that we need of, for the counterexample. That's not a counterexample. And here, false conclusion, true premise, but not all true premises. So no counterexamples, which means we can say the argument is valid. Whee! It's valid. Yay. So if we're looking for a counterexample and can't find it, if there's no possibility under which all the premises are true and the conclusion false, then that's what it means to say the argument is valid. And this, that's the cool thing about these truth tables, is that they let us look at it exhaustively. I'll say more about this in my next video, about how we can have so much confidence that the truth table is capturing all the possibilities. Um, but that's what's going on here. So I'm going to, um, I'm going to put this little die, I'm going to fix that typo, and then I'm going to put this up on Canvas so you can use this as a reference for doing all of your truth tables. Um, but this is really the full thing of everything we're going to be doing with this first crash course in formal logic. We want to understand um, the logical symbol language in its, in its real meaning, which again, meaning is given by truth conditions, basically by truth tables. So we want to understand how those work, and then we'll talk about how to translate. And the whole purpose of this is so that we can check to see if arguments are valid. On the second exam, there, when in the logic section, I'll be asking you to do all three of these steps. I'll be asking you to take an argument from English and put it into um, propositional logic, symbolic logic, to give me truth tables for claims and for full arguments, and then to check them for uh, validity using that truth table. So that's the game. That's what we're doing with formal logic. Um, this is approximately the kind of material that would be covered in mm, maybe your first week or two of a uh, Philosophy 120, the formal logic class. So um, this will give you a good taste of what you're in for. There's one really cool thing in logic that we're not going to be doing, that we aren't going to, we're not getting far enough to be able to do, um, and that's called uh, that's the the um, 
the task of generating proofs for um, claims in logic. And most of logic, if you actually go on and study it more, most of it is doing proofs. Um, but if you're cu curious about that, that's something I'd be happy to talk to you about outside of class. It definitely goes outside of what we're um, we're, we're going to be covering in, in this course with our curriculum. But if you are curious, you want to see more about that game, um, the whole making logical proofs game, uh, I'd be happy to show you a little bit of the ropes, give you a little bit more of a taste of it. But this is all that we're doing. This is everything I'll be talking about for the next few video lectures and everything that you'll be asked to do for the exam. So there you go, and uh, see you next time as we dive into more of the details. Bye.